Welcome to the Geek Therapy Radio Podcast. I am your mental curator, Johnny Hamburger. Thank you so much for joining me today. I've got an exciting topic. Well, it's very exciting to me. It's very exciting to a lot of uh, retro gamers out there and just people who like to tinker with handheld computers, period. Um, I know that I am super excited for this because I am one to uh, frequently play and bust out my various Game Boys. Here's I got my Game Boy, uh, I've got my Game Boy Color next to me right now, uh, with my EverDrive GB cartridge, uh, which I will get to in a moment because that will come into play here in the discussion. But there is a new product from Analog coming out next year. Just says sometime 2020. It is called the Analog Pocket, and that is what I want to discuss on the podcast. Today, Geek Therapy Radio. All right, so let's dive in. I've got the Analog Pockets website open here because as of right now, it is not something that we can physically hold in our hands. This was an announcement made just a day or two ago but I am psyched about it. Uh, So let's just go through the website here and the first description here for those just listening. A multi-video game system portable handheld, a digital audio workstation with a built-in synthesizer and sequencer. A tribute to portable gaming, out of the box pocket is compatible with the 2,780 plus Game Boy, Game Boy Color, and Game Boy Advance game cartridge library. Pocket works with cartridge adapters for other handheld systems too, like Game Gear, Neo Geo Pocket Color, Atari Lynx, uh, and more. Completely engineered in two FPGAs. And then they underline, no emulation. I think this is a good point to explain uh, the definition of what a FPGA is. It's a field programmable gate array. And I'm going to take this definition from the Exalynx uh website. I will we'll include links to everything that I'm talking about here in the description below. Uh, but the answer to the question, what is an FPGA? And again, I'm just saying this to bring everybody up to speed of what that means, why that's important, and why that's really cool in the analog pocket. Okay, so what is an FPGA? Field programmable gate arrays, FPGAs, are semiconductor devices that are based around a matrix of configurable logic blocks, CLBs, connected via programmable interconnects. FPGAs can be reprogrammed to desired application or functionality requirements after manufacturing. That's what's critical about it. You can make an FPGA do almost whatever you want it to do. If you want it to act like a Game Boy. You can have it act like Game Boy circuitry. If you wanted to act like Game Gear circuitry, you can have it act like Game Gear circuitry. Uh, This feature feature distinguishes FPGAs from application-specific integrated uh, circuits, or ASICs, which are custom manufactured for for specific design tasks. Although one-time programmable OTP FPGAs are available, the dominant types are SRAM-based, which can be reprogrammed as the design evolves. That is what makes the analog pocket so unique among handheld gaming systems. I know there's seemingly an infinite amount of devices to come out of Japan that run different emulators. You can play your Game Boy games on on uh, devices from uh, China. Uh, sorry, did I say Japan or China? De- cheap devices from China or expensive devices from China that vary in quality have many various different uh, processors in there they don't scale correctly the screens aren't exactly the precise pixels of the game boy uh, in this application so it's hit or miss what the analog pocket aims to do is change all of that and be and be able to provide faithful reproduction of your entire game boy uh, library for sake of arguments on one device as you scroll down uh Here's the description of the screen. Pocket is designed around a first-in-class 3.5-inch 615 PPI LCD with a resolution of 1600 by 1440. So the Pocket has 10 times the resolution of an original Game Boy. Um, Pro-level color accuracy, dynamic range and brightness. There has, quote, never been a display this advanced in a video game system. 
So I want to comment on that super high resolution screen because, yes, it's been said that it can seem like overkill, but here's what super high resolution allows. It allows for more perfect uh, scaling opportunities for whatever game you're playing or whatever system you're playing. So Game Gear has a different resolution than Game Boy. Game Boy has a different resolution from Atari Lynx, what have you. What all of that resolution allows is more pixel perfect kind of scaling up or down of the original system. But here's the big thing to me. Here's what 1600 by 1440 means to me. Shaders. It means shaders are going to look absolutely magnificent on the analog pocket. Mark my words. So the shaders that I'm most interested in are shaders that emulate uh, the actual LCD screen. Oh, I've got it in my backpack back there, but uh, the Game Boy Pocket, I'm holding up my Game Boy Color right now, which has a super crisp screen, but you can do a shader that emulates the actual real world look of the Game Boy Color screen, the TFT Active Matrix screen here in the Game Boy Color. What's even cooler almost to me is not only emulating the puke green display of the original uh, Game Boy brick, the OG Game Boy, but when you held, those of you who are old enough to remember, or you can be young and have your share of collectible Game Boys, and you might, may have noticed this, that when you play it in direct, really good direct lighting or direct sunlight or right underneath a strong lamp, say what have you, on the Game Boy Pocket and the original Game Boy, the actual LCD crystals themselves cast a shadow. When they're darkened, they actually cast a shadow on uh, the glass behind it or the filter behind the actual LCD layer. So shaders are going to allow you to emulate and simulate that shadow casting effect of the individual pixels itself and that is what super high resolution allows i haven't heard anybody else mention that i haven't watched every single youtube video or read every single blog about this so i'm sure maybe somebody has mentioned this fact but uh the shaders are going to look really awesome and that's only possible because of such a high resolution that w would allow it so let's say you're at the 160 by 144 pixels of the original Game Boy. I think, is it 160 by 144? It's thereabouts, if not exactly what I just said. Um, it's going to take extra pixels to simulate the shadow underneath the LCD pixel and have the gradient of the shade underneath it. Not just one pixel of shade, but actual many, many pixels of shading gradient under each pixel. And again, that can only be allowed for with the super high resolution. So one more time, that's a three and a half inch screen, 615 PPI at 1640 uh, resolution. 1600, 1600 by 1440 resolution. That is awesome. So it's gonna have a built-in uh, music sequencer for all you chip tuners out there who like to use uh, Nano Loop on your original Game Boy. It's going to include Nano Loop uh, on the actual analog pocket itself. I have personally never used Nano Loop. I well, I mean I've dabbled. It's not something that I've ever got into in earnest. Yes, I use Pro Tools and Cakewalk Sonar and everything like that. Every single day I use um, a DAW, a digital audio workstation. Heck, in my home studio, I'm, I'm running my voice, not right now through this podcast, but I'll do a tour of my home studio. I'm using a, a tube microphone preamplifier. I'm using a tube compressor, all that good stuff. I'm about to go do a tour and record a podcast or a radio show at my buddy Chris's recording studio. Chris heads up Handy Amps, where he builds custom guitar amplifiers and microphone preamps and compressors from scratch. So I use a lot of uh, musical equipment. I play guitar myself. I use mixers all the time. I mean, I, I went to sound school, but I have not uh, messed with nano loop specifically but for all you chip tuners out there nano loop is included on the uh, analog pocket and since it's an fpga this is all hardware level stuff it's going to be pretty true to form as far as 8-bit music creation is is concerned and it's cool that it's included with a headphone jack on the analog pocket so also, what that FPGA allows is for FPGA development. So people making their own homebrew, homebrew people developing their own, maybe they they want to port 
I don't know, something just they want to port Ultima to Game Boy or something like that. Uh, maybe they want to port. Oh, there's anything. There's any number of things that can be ported from one thing to another. And FPGA would al allow for that because users, uh, developers can, quote, develop and port their own cores. So um, according to Analog here, quoting with access to Analog's proprietary hardware and scalers, we think developers are going to do some amazing things. And I would, of course, absolutely agree with that. That's one of the draws of this device. And may I just say right now that this thing looks gorgeous it looks absolutely stunning and i will say i didn't realize maybe i should say i didn't want to admit how much aesthetics plays into a purchasing decision this thing is going to cost two hundred dollars i hung my head because that is very expensive my flesh is willing but my wallet is weak Let's just say $200 is a lot to spend, but this thing looks so good. It looks like it's going to be built so well and offers so much capability. If I haven't made it clear, which I don't think I have yet, this is going to run actual cartridges. So it says there's no emulation and it says it is not going to be capable of running ROMs off of the micro SD card. But let me just say right now, that's BS. That's going to change quickly. Someone is going to, let's just say, manipulate this to load ROMs onto the micro SD card within the first, within the first three days. Mark my words. Maybe quicker, maybe a few days. It's you're going to be able to run. Mark my words. ROMs off your micro SD card. I'm not necessarily encouraging you to do that. There's legal gray area there, but. You know what? That's not the point of this discussion here. That's not the point of this podcast. I'm just telling you about the analog pocket. They say that it's not going to be able to run ROMs off their micro SD card, but you know that's going to get hacked like everything else. Um, let's scroll through some pictures here. Yeah, I'm saying I was saying how gorgeous this thing looks loaded with a Game Boy cartridge. This looks like uh, and I'll include links, of course, if you're just listening to this. This looks like a Game Boy pocket. Except the screen is much bigger than a Game Boy Pocket. Obviously, it is way higher resolution. It's nice. It looks like real glass. Um, ooh, it looks so good. It looks so good. The shoulder buttons are built in uh, where the cartridge goes, so not on the top, really. Um, there's no shoulder buttons. Like if, if you're picturing a Game Boy Color, there's no shoulder buttons on the top, left, and right corners, but they're back uh, kind of recessed and behind, halfway up the back of the body. Uh, at the actual uh, cartridge slot. So Analog Pocket says one more thing. There will be a dock available. So like the Nintendo Switch, you will be able to dock the Analog Pocket and out and play it on your HD TV and you can pair it up to any Bluetooth controller. They're mentioning 8-bit Doe controllers. I call them 8-bit Doe because you don't pronounce it Nintendo uh, Do. They say some people say 8-bit Do. Do you call it a Nintendo? No, Nintendo. So I say 8 bit dough, but to each their own. A sus, a sus, whatever you want to say. 8 bit dough, 8 bit do. Uh, the point is that the dock will be able to connect wirelessly with Bluetooth controllers, but it also includes a few USB ports for hardwired controllers as well. That means you can use your original NES controllers that go to a, an, a USB adapter and, pl oop, and play games like that with actual. Um, legitimate old uh, joysticks and controllers, not just newfangled Bluetooth controllers. Although I will say, I freaking love 8-Bit Doe. 8-Bit Doe makes bar none, and this is not a stretch to say, the best third-party controllers of anyone in decades. This is not the old Mad Cats trash that we had in the early 2000s. <laughs> Mad Cats and 64 controllers and whatever before then. Garbage, no. 8 bit Doe makes awesome controllers, so I couldn't think of a, a better pairing than an 8 bit Doe controller with an analog pocket connected to a dock to the TV. Of course, the dock will be extra, will cost extra, like everything in life. It's not shipping with the dock. Uh, the pocket itself is shipping in 2020 for $199, like I mentioned. You can sign up early and get updates, um, and it's just limited quantities available. So let's go over the specs one more time and maybe a few other things I haven't 
mentioned. I'm so excited about this. Okay, Pocket Tech Specs, according to the website here. Compatible with Game Boy, Game Boy Color, and Game Boy Advance game cartridges. 3.5 inch LTPS LCD. What does LTPS stand for? I can't even, I don't even know. I've never even seen that before, honestly. Um, it's good. It's a good display. Uh, 1600 by 1440, like we mentioned, 615 PPI, rechargeable lithium ion battery. That's a big point there. Although, why would it be powered off of double A's or triple A's in 2019? Everything's lithium ion. So it's a rechargeable lithium ion battery, and the makers say, just trust us, it's going to last a very long time. And I have every reason in the world to believe them. Uh, all the buttons are mappable. That I don't think that comes as any surprise. Uh, stereo speakers, so not just headphone output, but stereo speakers. Uh, micro SD, USB-C charging. Uh, that 3.5 millimeter headphone output I described, I would assume that that's going to have some sort of line level capability, line output capability, because you don't include software like NanoLoop in there for chip tuners and not have a line level headphone output. That's just my prediction. I think it's going to be line level. I think it's going to output a really nice, nice audio output from this thing. Um, something cool, original style link plug. So the original uh, link cable of the uh, Game Boy is going to be included in case you want to link it to. I want to say you'd probably, if you have two copies of Tetris, one of them on an original Game Boy and one of them in the analog pocket, I don't see why it wouldn't communicate with each other. It's not such a stretch of the imagination to think that it would. Uh, so if you want to connect two analog pockets together, sure, you can play two player with two separate devices over the original Game Boy Link cable. Why would they say rechargeable battery again? They said that twice. Rechargeable lithium ion battery. Then a few more bullet points. Rechargeable battery. Yeah, we got that. Why? <laughs> He said it twice. Uh, so the analog dock, here's the tech specs of the dock. HDMI output, of course. Uh, two USB inputs for wire controllers, uh, Bluetooth for wireless controllers, and DAC compatible. Digital to analog converter compatible. So if you have a nice DAC in your system, let's say you're a DJ and you're going to use nano loops, you're going to do all your chip tuning stuff, the dock is DAC compatible. So you're going to get a nice, clean audio out of this i'm going to read their little disclaimer here towards the bottom of the website because it goes towards their the rom files i was mentioning earlier analog pocket does not play rom files it plays legacy game cartridges via the cartridge slot analog pocket is not designed using software emulation it is designed using a, a specialty hardware chip called an fpga which operates on a tr transistor level implementation of its functionality Awesome. Analog Pocket does not operate utilizing pre-existing BIOS files from any other entities. That's a big that's a big one right there. Analog engineers everything from scratch in-house. All trademarks are property of blah blah blah. Sega Game Gear Neo Geo. Um, so Game Gear Neo Geo Pocket and Atari Lynx and other cartridges uh, compatibility requires cartridge adapters that will be sold separately. That's a big point right there, too. You're not going to be able to play Game Gear cartridges right out of the box because that wouldn't make sense really now, would it? Of course, you would need an adapter. Still cool that it's available there. That is until people hack the micro SD card uh, slot in. Just load ROMs and BIOS on there. Uh, analog Pocket and Analog Dock are in development and details are subject to change. So, Analog Pocket, $199 or $200 analog dock price to be announced. Uh, both are coming in 2020. I am super duper excited about it. And there's one thing I wanted to mention, and this may be a use case scenario that is that is individual to me and any of my cohorts with the awesome, awesome EverDrive GB Game Boy cartridge. This accepts uh, ROMs from Game Boy and Game Boy Color. Uh, ROMs. It's really cool. You can play a lot of homebrew on here. It's really cool to play other people's homebrew. Just private developers that develop their own thing. They're not licensed by anybody. They're just people tinkering away in their basements, in their bedrooms, or whatever, making games for that run on Game Boy and Game Boy Color. That's one thing that makes EverDrive GB so cool. It's going to be 
awesome to plug the EverDrive GB into the analog pocket and have all your homebrew available on the analog pocket and use it for further development of homebrew. Another thing that's to be seen, and I hesitate to mention this, um, other devices like this in the past have been used to rip ROMs right off the cart. Are we going to be able to do that? I've never done that personally. I've hand to, hand to Gavin. I have not uh, ripped ROMs off of carts myself. Absolutely not. I have backed up save files using, oh, what was it called? It was like a Game Genie type of thing where you could plug a cartridge in and back up save files. I have the device. I'm blanking out on it. Um, I will, if I remember, I'll put a, a link in the description down here. If I upload this to YouTube, I'll put a picture of it. But I have backed up save files, and I've taken those save files and through some wizardry, put them on my computer so I could play, uh, pick up where I left off playing an emulator on the computer. Let's say I'm I'm playing Link's Awakening D DX, and I want to play continue my save file out on another system like the computer. I used a device like that to, to take the actual save file off of the actual cartridge and play it elsewhere on other systems. I own Link's Awakening. I don't see it there being a problem with that. Um, but it's to be seen whether the analog pocket will be capable of doing so. So let's say you have a massive, massive Game Boy uh, collection, Game Boy cartridge collection. You own 200 Game Boy cartridges and they get the SD slot hacked. And maybe you don't want to carry around 200 Game Boy cartridges with you. I think you'll, they will, I don't want to say it too, too soon because we haven't seen it yet, but it would not, it would not, um, surprise me if you can rip ROM files off of cartridges with the, with a pocket analog, with analog pocket. That's to be seen. Don't quote me on that. I will just not be surprised. Just like I won't be surprised when somebody hacks and unlocks the SD card slot. Either way. Those of us in the retro handheld gaming community, and there are lots of us, are very, very excited for the Monster Pocket. Or, that's just what I'm looking at right now. The Analog Pocket. And I would say, I've been excited to purchase the Nintendo Switch Lite. I'm just going to say right now, even though I, I can't possibly compare the two of them together because they both don't exist in the real world yet. Game Boy Lite obviously does. The analog pocket doesn't, but I'm just saying right now, if I had $200 right now and I'm sitting there on Amazon looking at both of these things, I would get the analog pocket. I would absolutely get the analog pocket over the Nintendo Switch Lite. That's just me talking right now off the cuff. It just looks so cool. I'm so excited about it. Anyways, at that rate, thank you for listening to the Geek Therapy Radio podcast this week. I've got some awesome content coming up on the podcast and the radio show and of course on youtube i'm going to visit my chris my chris my friend chris at his recording studio uh, handy amps gonna geek out about analog gear and, and tubes and compressors and mic pre's and all that good stuff uh the show this week coming up is having to deal with uh, quantum computing. I've got a scientist on the show answering quantum computing questions about the future of quantum computing. When can we feasibly expect quantum computing to be a part of our everyday life? What aspects of the world is quantum computing going to impact and make better? Can quantum computing possibly make things worse? You know, AI and all that scary stuff. So that's a show I have coming up this weekend. So you want to make sure that you're subscribed to the podcast if you haven't already. If you're in Houston cruising around, the show actually broadcasts Saturday nights at 10 p.m. on KPRC 950. Six million people in Houston. The signal covers every single human brain within that, within that area. That doesn't mean six million people are listening. But it's just kind of fun to know that my electromagnetic waves are, whether you like it or not, that sounds really creepy, are going through you. I probably shouldn't have said that. That sounds really, really, really creepy. But it's fun to broadcast on AM radio, and I truly do appreciate it. So make sure you're subscribed to all the good stuff. Geek Therapy Radio on Facebook, Geek Therapy Radio Instagram, uh, Twitter, YouTube, all the good stuff. If you want to email me, geektherapy at iheartmedia.com. One more time, geektherapy at iheartmedia.com. I've got the Patreon link below. 
If you want to consider doing it, it's very much appreciated. Obviously, you don't have to, but I do let you know that 5% each month goes to help those with mental illness. Before I take my cut, 5%, and if I start making more money off of it, I will increase that to 10%, of course. Um, but I'm poor too right now, so 5% uh, goes towards helping those with um, mental illness health issues that's very important to me so as i wrap this podcast up i will of course do my normal encouragements first and foremost you are worthy of love you are worthy of giving love you are worthy of receiving love and you are worthy of loving yourself that is often the hardest thing for a lot of us is just loving ourselves and respecting ourselves we can show other people love and respect but when we look in the mirror that can be very difficult. So my encouragement is just to work each day at chipping away at that wall, at that barrier keeping b- between you and loving and respecting yourself. How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. How do you bring down a wall? One brick at a time. So let's just work on loving our and respecting ourselves one day at a time. Just chip away at it. Do something cool that makes you feel good. Um, something artistic and creative, some sort of outlet, a new hobby, a passion, whatever. If you're if you're into sewing, if you're into RC airplanes, cars, whatever, get into that. That'll help you with the self-respect, and you'll see that you are absolutely worthy of love. Be good to yourselves and others. Know that we are all geeks about something, so embrace your inner geek. And I'll see you next time. Therapy Radio, Saturday night at 10 on KPRC 950 or listen anytime on our iHeartRadio app.